Hello everyone. I'm Bradley Barth, Senior Reporter at SC Media. Welcome to today's webcast titled, What's on Your Network? Four Steps to Delivering a Practical, Resilient, and Scalable Endpoint Security Strategy, sponsored by Great Bay Software. With mounting cybersecurity threats, aging network security infrastructure, and an explosive growth in unmanaged endpoints and Internet Things devices, enterprise IT leaders are facing an unprecedented security risk, and regulated industries such as finance and healthcare face an even steeper challenge. Today's webcast will cover security innovations that deliver endpoint discovery, visibility, and control, and how these capabilities can help create a secure, scalable, and resilient network. It will address how to remove network blind spots, streamline compliance, mitigate risk with device behavior monitoring, enhance, security, uh, enhance current security infrastructure, and securely embrace internal IoT initiatives. Our speaker today is Dino Balifus, VP of Product Management and Marketing at Great Bay Software. Dino brings more than 25 years of marketing, product strategy, and product management experience to Great Bay. Most recently, he served as Vice President of Global Marketing and Product Management at TeamQuest Corporation, driving big data, predictive analytics, and microservices initiatives. Prior to TeamQuest, Dino worked at DataCard for five years as VP of Products and Service, where he led the global business focused on secure banking and government transactions. As a reminder, there will be a Q&A following the presentation, so I would encourage you to type in any questions for our speaker via the interface. And also, and I'll remind you of this uh, later in the presentation as well, but uh, slides will also be uh, available uh, to uh, viewers of the presentation, and um, we will follow up uh, post-webinar with the slides. So with that, uh, I'd like to now welcome in our presenter, Dino, thanks so much for being with us today. Well, Brad, thank you very much for the fine introduction. I appreciate it greatly. <clears throat> Before we kick it off and uh, start on the agenda, I'd actually like to take a moment, uh, moment of silence for the people that are suffering down in uh, Texas uh, given Hurricane Harvey. So if you wouldn't, if you wouldn't mind uh, joining me for a moment, uh, just uh, share our thoughts out with them. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much, and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm looking forward to the call today. Uh, again, I'd like to encourage uh, Q&A at the end. If you, if you run into a question along the way, please, uh, please type it in, and uh, we'll do our best to resolve them during the presentation today. And if we're unable to do so, uh, we certainly will follow up afterwards and send you a direct email with a response. Uh, give us uh, a day, uh, two days on the top end, but a, a day should, we should do it uh, for us to respond. In uh, today's agenda, what I'd really like to go through is really uh, four subject areas. One, talk a little bit about the Internet of Things and threat management, how, the, how security is being adjusted as we add more and more devices into the network. I'll sometimes call them things since they are different than what we're used to operating. I'd like to go through a high level four steps uh, for network security. Um, and this isn't meant to be an exhaustive list, but it's a very good starting point, especially as we take a look at the Internet of Things and, and where to start and how to think about securing those environments. I'd, look, I'd like to look at also mitigating uh, future risk um, in those uh, environments. And then I'm going to close with just a couple of brief examples, the product examples that happen to be from our product, uh, but this is the type of thing that you would want to look for in uh, resolving these types of security issues in uh, the Internet of Things. Uh, and then as, as mentioned, we'll close with a, a Q&A, a live Q&A. So uh, why don't we start off with a quick poll. I wanted to give a, a little understanding on where everyone is at in terms of their Internet of Things journey regarding security specifically. So uh, if you wouldn't mind taking a look at the uh, polling questions and responding, the specific question is, when it comes to IoT, what best describes your current network security? And I'll let you read uh, the sentences beyond. All 
right. I think that concludes the responses. And um, all right, we have a fair amount. We have about a quarter of you uh, that are interested in just educating yourselves, uh, thinking that uh, Internet of Things are something that's probably being talked about a lot, and just understanding where you know what potential security risk. And that's great. Welcome. Uh, we. <laughs> There's no one who's in that pool. Uh, well, you know, we, we think we've got it deployed to some degree, but not like, sure. Um, I, uh, almost half of the uh, organization, uh, is, uh, excuse me, half of the participants here are looking at this as a growing concern uh, in the network. And I would suggest that uh, as you're bringing in your own devices into the networks and as you're expanding into um, smart devices on the on the network security is a big aspect, and this is good. This is really the the uh, audience, uh, one aspect of the audience that we're uh, trying to target. And then lastly, over a quarter looking at it as a very hot topic uh, in the industry. So that's good. It's a great mix. Um, thank you very much for taking the the poll and um, help me a little bit uh, direct the content as we go forward. So. Let's start off. I really want to um, kind of set the stage uh, and take a look at three areas. One, uh, look at the hyper growth of IoT, Internet of Things. Then look at critical security controls. Take a look at what the industry says the areas of focus should be. And then lastly, look at how threats are evolving uh, in, the, in the market uh, today and see how that might relate as we try to secure other devices uh, going forward. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, I, the, uh, the growth uh, of uh, the Internet of Things. Uh, this is kind of an interesting, uh, interesting chart. Uh, this is looking at adoption curves. Uh, and on the, uh, the orange adoption, adoption curve, which at the time was a very fast, fast rate, was AOL, desktop Internet. You can remember way back then, I hate to say I'm old enough that I can. Uh, remember that it took about five years for it to reach 20 million subscribers, uh, which was great growth then. If we take a look uh, a little faster, uh, we look at Netscape, one of the first uh, browsers to come out, uh, got to be about 45 million, 50 million, uh, and that took about three years, a little over three years. And then the uh, adoption rate uh, for cell phones, specifically iPhones, iPhone touches, uh, significantly increased in terms of the rate of adoption for these devices in about two years, maybe a little bit more, 60 million uh, plus, uh, um, and then going on to 80 million devices. Uh, and then if we look at the, uh, well, there should be an arrow on the um, Internet of Things. That is a very, very steep uh, upward um, upward projection where within two years we have well over 100 million uh, devices that have uh, come on board. As a matter of fact, you'll see in a uh, slide a little later in the presentation, Gartner estimates that there will be 20, more than 20 billion devices out um, in the Internet of Things uh, by the year 2020. So huge and very, very fast growth within this area that presents some security concerns in the sense that as we're bringing in more of these devices, uh, gaps can be exploited. And since there's more of them, it takes us longer to fill those gaps and, uh, and secure those types of devices. So uh, let's take a look at some of the security controls. I like uh, citing the um, CIS, uh, which stands for, let me make sure I get the acronym right, uh, Center for Internet Security. Uh, this is uh, looking at the needs and doing a survey in terms of what are the top security needs uh, today in, in the market. And uh, if you look, the top five actually center all around knowing what's out in the network. So um, the inventory of uh, unauthorized devices and authorized devices, uh, number one issue uh, in securing a network. Second issue is knowing what software is out there. Uh, determining vulnerabilities, the fourth issue. As, as we go further and further through, through that list, you know, we'll get into uh, other applications and other items, software security and other elements, all very, very important. But one of the key, key findings in, in this area of research is that 
of the ability to understand what is on the network so you have visibility to what's in the environment. Because if you can't see it, you can't secure it. So that's number one aspect. And then knowing what it is is a second uh, very important aspect in terms of uh, network security. Uh, knowing what's connecting to your environment and why. So uh, some key points uh, going forward in terms of, uh, of uh, securing the, uh, the Internet of Things. The third area to take a look at is how the, what's been happening in terms of threats in the market. How have those been uh, progressing? Originally, uh, it's one of the biggest areas of, um, of uh, attacks centered around um, DOS, um, basically inundating a website with so many transactions that it wouldn't be able to serve, uh, serve legitimate customers or le legitimate users of the uh, environment, uh, denial of services, uh, the acronym for, for uh, DOS. Uh, and that's still very prevalent today. As a matter of fact, I was reading a, uh, a web paper uh, from Microtens on uh, some research there. Uh, you can find or pay for as little as $150 to get a, a, a denial of service attack. And these are still very prevalent today. More than 2,000 attacks are happening worldwide to date. So certainly something that started off early as uh, security threats, uh, denial of service, it's something that's still with us today as we go forward. Uh, the attacks have gotten more sophisticated in time, and uh, where we've been where we've been transitioning uh, into what we will call cyber crime. So these would be uh, financial attacks, uh, either in uh, retailers trying to grab credit cards, uh, debit cards, etc., and providing uh, that uh, that um, information. Uh, or that data so that people can be exploited as going forward. Uh, their health records is an area of growing concern. Uh, there are very valuable pieces of information. There's fines associated with having patient health care records being uh, exploited from a particular uh, organization, a particular health service organization. Um, and it's something that's the uh, focus of cyber crimes. Uh, business secrets, of course, uh, being able to uh, take uh, research data out of, uh, of an identity and exploit it. And more recently, we've been seeing ransomware sort of uh, attacks where people's data is being held hostage and companies and uh, medical practices and individuals are paying to get to their data. Uh, and certainly it's been uh, growing in uh, frequency uh, in the market uh, to date. A third phase that we're looking at is what I would call more nation-state attacks. So this is really regarded more to cause harm necessarily. So think of uh, a, a group that wants to, uh, you know, terrorist sort of organization and wants to attack um, a particular um, group or a particular industry. So things like industrial control environments come to mind, the ability to get into a um, uh, oil refinery, uh, for example, and knock out the, uh, the processing capabilities of an oil refinery um, or energy or utilities of some sort and uh, exploiting, uh, taking advantage or shutting down those operations. Uh, so this is an area of uh, concern. Uh, we've, we've read, especially at state levels, of some of these attacks that have gone on uh, worldwide. And as we look at the Internet of Things and those uh, operational controls being added into the networks, into uh, Internet, that's going to increase the ability for those, um, those perpetrators for lack of a better term, to come in and exploit and, uh, and potentially attack those types of environments. If we take a look at where we are in that curve, where the, uh, the growth area, we're certainly in the uh, cyber crime phase, the ransomware, uh, healthcare, financial records, there's a lot of money that can be gained in those areas. And we are very much concerned in the nation state areas of shutting down and just causing havoc in terms of the operations. Of, of, a, of a system or a group of systems going forward. <clears throat> so what's different this time when we take a look at uh, the Internet of Things compared to when we were securing servers 
and workstations, etc. Well, today's attacks are more automated. Uh, in other words, bots can be and software programs can be made that can go out and test the integrity of environments to see if there are any known gaps or breaches. For example, if you haven't loaded the right patch level in a particular system and it recognizes that you're back revved a, a patch level, and therefore it can raise that to the attention of the hacker that this is a possible way of exploiting. Um, so what happens is hackers are able to send out groups of programs uh, going out, taking a look at what can be exploited, and then taking a look at the short list and seeing where they put, where their best potential for gaining monetary gain or extracting the most amount of, of uh, woe, for lack of a better term, um, in, into the environment and attack it specifically. The old adage of security by obscurity becomes more and more threatened as these types of automation and automated uh, bots get out there and take a look at what's going on uh, in the environment. Second is devices are, are becoming significantly more broad and significantly dumber. Um, you know, for example, uh, on, on the dumb end, it might be a Fitbit. Uh, no, nothing against the product. I personally own one. Um, but it is connecting with the Internet. It does know, know where your location is. If that data can be correlated with an uh, individual who might want to rob your house, knowing that you're, you're going out on a jog, um, an unsecured device like that can be uh, trouble. Uh, when we look at more sophisticated devices, like uh, in maybe in the medical industry where they're intended to be closed close systems, but on networks, those environment, those types of devices tend to, tend not to have the security elements that would normally be um, required in servers. They might be running back rounds of operating systems. They might not even use. Uh, current level operating systems. I happen to know of a few uh, medical devices that are still using essentially Windows XP, uh, completely unsupported uh, and unsecure uh, device uh, out in the market. So understanding what devices are being deployed and the longevity and the relative intelligence of those devices are all in question when we get in the Internet of Things. Um, third bullet, uh, we look at breaches. Um, these can be really, uh, to use a term, more like termites than uh, tornadoes. Uh, these, these types of breaches are looked at can be awfully quiet. As a matter of fact, it's to the uh, hacker's um, benefit to be able to slowly suck data out of an organization over a period of time. If we look at a major retailer that's based in Minnesota, and I won't name the name here, um, uh, that, that breach went on for a significant period of time before it was recognized and resolved. And that happens all over the place. The, the idea of, of putting in a, a Trojan horse that pulls information out of the organization um, is, uh, is a, a you know, significant factor in security. And when you look at it, that, that these can not only come from server devices now, but from HVAC systems, for example, or other types of systems that generally don't have the same level of sophistication and security, it becomes very problematic. Um, fourth bullet, bigger, faster innovation leads to more threats. The gaps don't get filled as fast. Um, and uh, that can lead to uh, problems. So one of the things that we like to counsel our customers and uh, people that we work with is don't wait for regulations to catch up. They're usually a rear view window sort of activity. Look at the size of your organization and what you're deploying and uh, be pro more proactive in terms of how you set up your programs for security going forward. It's very important. A security breach can be very costly to an organization. <clears throat> So uh, just to give uh, some ideas in terms of how broad the Internet of Things and the security threats are out there, it's a huge market. Uh, I've got some data here from uh, Gartner, uh, as indicated before, 20 billion items, and that's probably an underestimation uh, by 2020. A uh, significant amount of growth area, home systems, uh, in, you know, information entertainment environments, home security systems. Uh, I mean, these are all uh, areas that are coming online. It allows you to get, you know, turn on your lights, turn off your lights, 
Um, from a hacker's perspective, could there be some disruption and some benefit there? The answer is probably yes, and we certainly want to secure these areas. But one of the areas that really need to be focused in are the areas that are going to provide the most monetary gain uh, uh, for the hacking environment. So you take a look at uh, things like healthcare providers, the financial systems, uh, industrial control. These by, uh, by the uh, industry uh, leaders are, are the areas that are most are going to be and are most exploited and attacked within the uh, industry. These are the verticals that are most at risk. And the reason is specifically around money. Um, they, they're, the, they're the areas where the hackers can gain the most amount of money and uh, from, uh, from their hacks and go forward uh, with that. So we tend to focus in on areas in, um, in uh, the government, uh, healthcare, financial space, utilities, industrial controls as a, as a broader range, and those are the areas that are going to be uh, exploited the most uh, first. Um, so bottom line on security and securing things. Um, since so many things can be uh, interconnected and will be interconnected via the Internet, um, the, and each one of these areas are areas that can be exploited. Um, so HVAC systems, as I indicated, uh, bring your own device into the office, so your cell phones, uh, fire and security monitoring, uh, you know, alerting systems, not to mention your normal data processing, servers, uh, uh, printers, uh, network devices, et cetera. These are all entry points, all potential areas for uh, hackers or, or, uh, or uh, miscreants coming into uh, your environment and exploiting your environment. So one of the top things that needs to be understood is if you can't see it, you can't secure it. So uh, to use a house analogy, if you don't know you have a door in the basement, you don't know whether to put a lock on it or not, and someone can just walk right in. Uh, and then the second aspect is even if you can, can see it, can you identify what it is? As we go through hundreds of thousands to tens of thousands and even millions of devices, how are we going to be able to discern whether a new device coming onto the network is a potential threat or not? So being able to identify what it is, where it is, uh, who's using it, what its typical operation is, uh, is an important aspect, which leads me to the third bullet is how is the device behaving? Um, certain devices will act in certain ways. The printer usually prints. If it's trying to do FTP data, that's probably bad, uh, or there's something probably wrong with that, or maybe someone's exploiting and using it for nefarious means. So these top three are really, really important when you take a look at securing things. Being able to see 100% of the environment, uh, in real time uh, is key. Uh, being able to understand what is on the network, have I seen it before, do I trust it, or is it something that we really need to take a look at in, in more detail, uh, and then the uh, behavior of this. Is this a typical operating mode for a particular device? We need to understand these things going forward. Um, some of the security uh, equipment in the past has worked very, very well, Mac-based uh, network access control-based systems, for example. Um, however, they do have blind spots in the Internet of Things. Network, uh, some network access control systems require agents to be deployed. Well, it's hard to deploy an agent in a light bulb, for example, or a Fitbit, or perhaps an industrial control system that's running a machine or a medical device that has some level of sophistication but intended to be a closed system and operating on its own. So uh, certain aspects of the applications that you deploy need to take into account that you won't be able to get direct access into the device to monitor its usage. Uh, and then lastly, scalability, which I apologize for the spelling error there. Um, in, in, in real time, uh, we're adding millions and millions, there's going to be millions of uh, items being added to the uh, Internet of Things. Uh, can the application scale uh, so that you're able to holistically look at your environment and be able to monitor, uh, monitor all of it uh, as you grow with the uh, Internet of Things? So let's take a look at some of the steps for, uh, uh, to consider uh, as we go forward for the Internet of Things. So what, you know, what's connected to your network? You know, removing the blindfold and seeing everything within that network 
uh, 100% of the time in, in real time. Um, so one of, the, one of the things that we want to uh, take a look, one of the things we need to understand is whenever a device is accessing a network is to understand that it's accessing the network and then authorize it. Is this a device that should be on the network 100% of the time in real time? Uh, that's of pivotal importance going forward, probably the most important step as we saw in the uh, CIS uh, report uh, earlier. Um, we had a, for, to give you an example, we had a bank that was uh, interested in reducing the amount of time it took to understand what was uh, being connected to their network. In the past, they were using scanning mechanisms. Uh, scanning Scanners work, but they're obsolete the moment they stop, and they put generally a big burden in the environment. So if you run a scan once a week, the network slows down, the operations slow down, and then until the next scan, you have a potential breach. So those things are not uh, as effective going forward. Um, so this particular bank was looking at ways uh, of resolving that. They wanted to uh, get down to an hour. They thought that was a very lofty goal uh, to be able to uh, see any device coming into the network and uh, being able to access that device, uh, to understand and authenticate that device. Uh, we were able to do it in 40 seconds for their particular environment, uh, which was a, a significant uh, increase in terms of what they had. So that's a very important aspect. But it's not the only aspect in terms of discovering what's on, on the environment. The second aspect is knowing, understanding what that device is and where it's located. So collecting contents or richness of data is an important aspect within uh, IoT. What is that device that's being connected to it? Is it a cell phone? Uh, if so, what kind of cell phone? Uh, and what operating system is it using? Is there a known risk in that particular operating system? That data can actually be collect, collected and warehoused and then used as a way of building trust for the particular devices that are coming in into the environment as well. So um, uh, an inferior way is just understanding that a device is being connected. A better way of going about it is understanding what specifically is being connected and then as importantly, where it's located. Should it be? In this particular office, uh, if that's Dr. So-and-so's iPad and he's always in this medical facility and now he's showing up across the country and trying to access their data, maybe that's something we should, uh, we should take a look at in further detail. Um, so being able to build rich context and historical perspective of the particular devices that are, that are being uh, accessing your, your data. Uh, accessing your network is very important. <clears throat> uh, actually, you know what? I, I did want to uh, point out one other thing. Um, we do have a white paper on uh, on a similar subject, and uh, so look in this white paper is specifically around max spoofing. So max spoofing is taking an address and that once might be have been associated as a printer port, for example and then uh, using that uh, as, a, as your access port, as a hacker's access port to extracting data. Uh, and then that, that, since that port's authenticated onto the network, the uh, hacker then can get access and start pulling data or listening to uh, information on your network and pulling information out of, out of the network. That's uh, one of the many ways of hacking uh, into, a, uh, into a secure environment. Um, the, um, the white paper talks about uh, how to recognize that, and how rich context uh, provides you uh, the ability to know uh, where, the ability to identify such attacks and resolve those attacks in the future. And I offer that as a um, as a resource for you. It's on, it's on our web page, and um, and uh, you you might find it interesting if uh, you're interested in in understanding contextual uh, aspects of uh, identifying security breaches. <clears throat> Second step is behavior. So um, in the uh, first step, it's really identifying what's come, what devices are on the network and where they're located and what, what they are specifically, what type of devices. The, uh, the next aspect to take a look is how is that device behaving? There's really going to be three areas of behavior that we look at. One is expected behavior, what you might call a baseline. So, uh, for example, uh, the, the marketing team tends to use uh, these 
these particular group of servers, these particular uh, group of devices, uh, they have these types of data volumes in a, in a day. Um, and that's, that's the baseline, uh, and you can establish a baseline as you record the uh, behavioral usage of those systems. Uh, that serves as a good point to compare to what's happening in real time with those particular devices, devices and if any unexpected behavior occurs. For example, uh, an example of unexpected behavior might be those marketing systems are now uh, trying to uh, access information from the financial systems or the financial servers. Uh, or maybe it's uh, more about usage and trying to uh, access systems in another facility. Very unexpected, it's never happened before. Is it a security breach? Well, may maybe not necessarily. But it is probably something that you want to have a security analyst take a look at and, uh, and, and identify from a response standpoint to verify that it is not a nefarious attack of some sort. So uh, take, uh, behavior allows you to take a look at what's normally practicing and bubble up those things that are abnormal so that the response team can quickly uh, get to a problem resolution. Another aspect of behavior that can be troubling is usage variation. Uh, for example, if um, you send uh, 10 megabytes or th you know, let's say 100 emails a day, and all of a sudden that has increased 100-fold, 1,000-fold, that might be an uh, indication that someone's uh, accessed your or has control of your particular server or laptop and is using it for some uh, activity. Uh, maybe it's data volumes. Uh, a particular user uh, will use uh, so much data and then that's increased 10x. Uh, or maybe a, uh, what was typically a port used for a, a printer is now requesting FTP data. Those are all various usages that are really suspicious that, that um, if you understand behavior and do behavior analytics, those can bubble to the top so that you can take a look at in real time what's going on and identify if that's normal operation or if some sort of a planned um, mitigation uh, should occur, whether you put them on a segment that's uh, less prone to, uh, to internal data or lock them out entirely. <clears throat> uh, really, the concept here is by utilizing data that you've uh, that you've stored over time, so behavior that's been stored over time, comparing it to real usage, understanding systems that have come onto your networks and the types of systems that you have in your networks. You can build this portfolio of information about all the devices on your network, and then that can help you establish trust and identify anomalies for uh, new devices that may be accessing your system um, so that you know how to take action in the future. <coughs> Third area is uh, insecurity is uh, getting away from the silos uh, and leveraging more open architectures and building synergies across uh, across products. Uh, and this is an area that I think a lot of vendors uh, can improve upon. And I would put ourselves in that category, although we've made steps uh, in the right uh, in the right direction here. But let me give you an example about what what I'm talking about here. Uh, for example, in our product, we are, we are uh, understanding every device that's coming onto the network. We build a deep, detailed um, uh, pro uh, profile of those devices. We understand the usage characteristics of those devices. That helps us determine when something is anomalous in terms of behavior. But that data is also very, very useful for an asset management system, uh, for example. So being able to take that data and connecting it to a uh, asset management system where that data can be logged in real time and correlated with uh, another application would be a benefit uh, for the organization. So that's what I mean by ecosystem. Another example would be um, to use the WannaCry virus. Uh, a number of virus de uh, detection systems uh, may have recognized the virus coming in uh, and then understanding which systems are infected with that virus. Uh, that data could be shared with a control system, a control system like ours, for example, and then that data could be used to uh, control those, those particular uh, devices, maybe put them on a, 
a more secure network segment that, that's removed from the primary operation of the environment or maybe just shut them down entirely. So there are a couple of examples of how the interoperation of, of security uh, systems and software can interact and interplay with each other to really you know, create synergy, the, uh, the sum being greater than the parts. All right, uh, fourth one I wanted to look at. <clears throat> excuse me. Too many projects in too limited time. Um, and uh, this is something that I uh, run into every day. Um, meeting the demands of the uh, enterprise, when we start taking a look at how fast things are growing and how thin we're getting spread out, uh, you know, uh, by 2024, billion connected people. Uh, Four trillion uh, in uh, in uh, revenue uh, opportunity. We already talked about 20 billion uh, endpoints and growing in terms of the Internet of Things and more and more data. Um, the the ability to manage all that is going to uh, is, is staggering and uh, kind of staggering scary. Um, so a few of the best practices that we want to take a look at in terms of being able to manage these environments is you're going to have to be able to authenticate things and discover things in real time. Scanners aren't going to do it uh, and, and on a once a week or even a, a couple of times a week basis. Uh, you'll, you'll need to be able to see these in real time. Uh, and then you'll be able, and then it's going to be required that as these devices come in, uh, to make a determination of how well you trust them. Have there been something on the network before? Um, do we understand what their operation is? What type of system it is? What operating system it's using? Uh, what patch level it's on? These will all build trust that will let you will want to let it into your environment uh, to be able to uh, to utilize the services of, of that environment. Or maybe uh, they, you might not trust them enough and give them a, um, some access to a, a printer or allow them to use the guest network, for example, until trust can, it can be established. Those are key elements going forward. Uh, understanding the behavior uh, in real time is absolutely pivotal. Um, if something starts uh, requesting things that's never requested for, that's a really a uh, good spot to take a look at in terms of breach. So have automated alerting and then allow the responses to, to occur. Most organizations now want to be alerted to a situation so that they can examine it and not lock out the CEO, for example, from utilizing the system. Uh, but uh, being able to have a tiered automated response is probably the best practice in this case where until you build trust with, the, with an environment, maybe you put it into a guest type of environment uh, network uh, and then establish more and more trust before you allow it broader access. Um, and being able to automate that process uh, is going to be required as we look at tens of thousands of things going uh, forward. I mentioned evaluating trust. Uh, a lot of uh, systems today are based on all or nothing sort of access to the network. Either uh, you pass or you don't pass. Um, uh, there are gray, there's shades of gray in between as you can build uh, trust. Maybe you allow them some access to the environment. And so a, a method of building trust for new, new systems coming on, new devices coming on is uh, a best practice uh, going forward. <clears throat> So what I'd like to do is just walk through a couple of examples um, of what I mean by identifying uh, systems uh, coming into the environment. Uh, so taking a look at uh, you know, potential uh, behavior and uh, new product discovery uh, and, and new devices coming out of the network. These are just a couple of uh, screenshots that I, that I pull out of our particular product. I hope they serve as a, a little bit of an exemplar to kind of tie it together. Uh, they are certainly not meant to be uh, uh, complete in terms of context of how you would drive a workflow from identifying an original problem all the way to problem resolution. Just a couple of uh, steps along the way. Uh, if you were interested in something like that, I certainly would uh, be happy to get one of our, uh, our SEs to walk through a demo or taking a look at uh, our particular um, uh, your website to uh, find out a little bit more detail. So let's just go through a couple of examples here. All right, uh, I've got a few screenshots that I've put together here. Uh, one, if you look in the upper left uh, corner, 
Uh, this is just basically a high-level view of the uh, devices that are detected on the network. In this particular area, we used a uh, lab environment uh, and we were testing some, um, some medical equipment. So you see some uh, me uh, medical type uh, devices out on the network. Not a very exhaustive list here, but a, a quick understanding of what items have been profiled uh, in the network. Um, what we have is uh, we're coalescing uh, information uh, from a, a system that has uh, accessed the network, was being used in the network, and its behavior was such that it, uh, it, it caused a uh, anomaly breach and therefore it was, it was kicked, basically booted off the network. And so what the particular uh, errant device is, if you look over on the uh, the right screen, you'll see that it was an, an Apple-based uh, product. Uh, it's, a, it's an iPhone, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and when its behaviors, um, in, in this particular case, what we had it was access to a particular server. It wasn't, uh, it, wa it wasn't given access to. It was then moved into uh, a, a profile, what we called a, a bad endpoint profile. And, um, and then that forced it to be uh, kicked off of the network and basically it turned off the port. So uh, in this particular case, we took the most draconian measure that if a device was accessing a system that it shouldn't, we wanted to shut it down. Um, there are various rules-based uh, activities that you could utilize. Uh, um, for example, you could do nothing and allow it access. You could uh, send a, uh, a warning or an alert uh, that would hit the, uh, the service the security response team and then they would be made aware of it so that they could go track it. Uh, this information, there is information of where this uh, particular system is located. In, the, in, in this case, it's in our lab here in the uh, Great Bay Systems Lab. Um, you could uh, put it on its own segment. So there's various activities in terms of how you dealt with the particular um, behavioral issue that you ran into. Uh, in this particular case, like I said, we uh, took the, uh, the most draconian measure and booted it off the uh, system. Uh, second example is walking through uh, device discovery. Um, so again, a high-level view of what's going on in terms of new devices coming in. Each one of these can be uh, drilled down in more detail. Um, in this particular area, we have a uh, system that came on. Uh, it's a, uh, it was identified as a camera, but it's put in, into a rogue device because we didn't, it didn't meet a certain threshold of trust. Uh, to go forward. Uh, so this correlates, if you drill down, it correlates into the screens that you see on the right and gives you more information of what's going on. Uh, IP address, uh, the MAC vendor address, uh, last time it was discovered, uh, last time it was updated on the network, so has the system been on the network before, or is it a brand new system? Where is it located, which is pivotal? Where, where is it? Uh, and then the likelihood of what type of uh, device it is, in this case uh, an IP uh, camera is what it's presenting itself as. Uh, and then further information can be drilled upon to, uh, through, like our, through DHCP, which uh, is coming out of our, our warehouse of context and give you more details of what's running in the system. So what level of operating system it has, the patch level of that particular operating system, so if it's behind in patch levels, maybe something you don't want to allow into the network. And we could go further in terms of uh, behavior usage. How has that system been used in the past if it's not the first time in? So um, a lot to cover on a particular slide, but the ability to drill down and, and understand what's going on in a particular device. <coughs> Uh, last item is um, uh, device uh, identification, uh, in, and this is uh, specifically unexpected behavior uh, in a particular device. So uh, the, one of the devices that had been uh, put on the, uh, in the environment, uh, which was on, let me take a look at the ports. Yeah, port, uh, was originally on port 7. It, it uh, basically was defined as a device that shouldn't be moving. So this device should be located in this particular area and should not be moved. And then what, uh, from the behavior aspect, this device was moved. It moved to uh, two new locations, uh, 
port 7 and port uh, 15, and that's what flagged the event from occurring. So there's a duplicate address out on the, out on the, out on the network. This device is being moved from port to port. That is not a typical behavior. It's being flagged as an anomalous behavior, and it's being alerted that this particular uh, item may be a problem. You, uh, you should check into it. It also could um, trigger rules, like shutting down of the port, as we saw in the first screen, or uh, maybe being uh, segmented into a guest-type network uh, for a period of time. So um, just to uh, really conclude in terms of uh, products and, and what we focus in on uh, in the Internet of Things is identifying all devices, 100% of the devices being entered in the network. And this is done not through agents but through passive uh, integration. Um, so listening out on the network through DNS tables, uh, using SNMP traps, for example, uh, pulling, uh, pulling data from uh, the radius server or SIM and other data points and pulling all that data together, correlating it, and building a warehouse of context for every device that's being utilized in the system. Uh, if a new device is coming in and we don't have any historical perspective, we can start interrogating and understanding the type of device it is, the types of behaviors that those devices have done, in the uh, environment and then compare and contrast those to see if this new device is operating in a mat matter that's consistent or not consistent, uh, and then being able to build a trust model or establishing trust for all the devices that we have in the, in, in the environment in the network. Next stage is uh, managing the risk. How do you control what's in the environment once you know what it is, how it's utilized, how do you want to act on, on, on uh, you know, potential rogue devices coming in uh, or if anomalous behavior occurs? How do you want to react to it? Is it a warning? Is it isolation? Is it being booted off? And then uh, lastly, an area is you know, taking action in more collaborative um, methods. So connecting uh, applications like Splunk, for example, ServiceNow, uh, maybe a uh, virus uh, malware uh, product like McGaffey, and then exchanging information back and forth to have build uh, a more synergistic uh, solution uh, for your overall environment. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank everyone for participating. And I think we have a few minutes for questions. So I thought uh, we, uh, if we have any, Let's uh, let's go. All right, sounds great, Dino. Right. So let's start with uh, this one. Can you comment regarding network access control solutions, uh, and uh, why why are they challenged in Internet of Things environments? Okay, so. Uh, uh, First off, there's nothing wrong with network access control systems. Uh, they're great. Uh, the biggest challenge is um, when we get into the Internet of Thing environments, we get into environments where you have uh, the things aren't necessarily sophisticated um, or they're closed systems, meaning uh, that you can't go in and readily load applications on them uh, or agents in ways of uh, determining how they're operating. So uh, in, in a typical agent-based network access control system, it's hard to get the data that you need to make a decision whether that endpoint should be allowed under the network or not. So they, they tend to be very problematic. Uh, in, um, in, uh, so this doesn't mean you have to replace your network access control system. It means you need to augment your network access control system so that, it, so that other methods are used to be able to determine whether you try, you know, what's the system at the other end? Uh, do you trust that system? How is it behaving so that you give it access into uh, your environment or not through an agent loss design? Great. Okay. Yeah, next question. Uh, can I leverage any of the existing security systems on the enterprise or IT side of the network? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I was probably alluding to that just a little bit. Um, absolutely, there is um, 
there is no single application that I know of anyway that resolves all uh, aspects of security. Um, so there's going to be a number of systems that are deployed uh, in a secure environment. We, you know, we just spoke a little bit about network access control systems for um, some of the uh, servers and app applications. Uh, certainly virus and malware uh, applications, uh, the experts in those areas are the experts in those areas. What we, what we really need to, do to build is interconnectivity between them um, so that data and information can be shared. I said this a little earlier uh, in the presentation. Um, you know, for example, if an application like ours is collecting hundreds and hundreds of data points about every device in the environment, what uh, rev level the operating system at is at, what patch level is at, where it's located in terms of uh, location, the IP address, the MAC address, that's really useful information uh, for other applications. Uh, Splunk might want to use it for um, what, what it, what its, uh, you know, some of its capabilities. Uh, asset management system comes to mind readily and uh, would want to store that information uh, and, and use it for uh, asset inventory, uh, et cetera. Or uh, the other way, uh, a virus, uh, we've got a virus infecting our environment. Um, where, what's the location of these particular systems and can we shut them down and slow down the spread of the virus internally? Can we stop it from communicating with other systems? Um, these are really great gains that aren't very prevalent in the uh, market today in an area that vendors, areas of, like vendors like us are absolutely headed towards and providing more sophisticated tools through interoperation as we uh, solve some of the security problems both in the Internet of Things and in more traditional enterprise uh, networking environments. Okay, uh, next question. Does endpoint profiling and fingerprint include traffic profiling and traffic profile changes over a time period? Um, so, import, um, so what? Uh, you know, specifically our part, we're not cracking packets and reading into the packets, and I'm not sure if that's what specifically was asked. But what the profiling does do is is take a look at um, how each of the devices have been accessing the networks and what it's accessing in the networks and the types of uh, types of access it's requiring. For example, uh, a printer is generally receiving information and it's, it's, it's doing its thing. Um, it's not sending out FTP commands um, out on the network and asking to move data across the network. Uh, we would be, through our, through our uh, profiling aspect, we would identify that action is never taken in the past. Uh, it's not uh, part of its normal behavior and that gets flagged um, and uh, and then whatever action the enterprise has decided would happen, whether you want to isolate it, turn it off, or just flag it and, and alert somebody. <clears throat> so hopefully I, uh, I address that question. If not, please uh, please uh, send a follow-on, and I'll uh, do my best to, uh, to clarify. Great. Okay, and then moving on to the next one here. Um, how would you find devices that only listen to your traffic and send out what it sees over cellular networks? Yeah, so we, we pulled data off of, um, uh, uh, we interface with the, uh, the wireless, uh, wireless router aspect and we are able to, uh, to uh, collect information uh, regarding wireless, um, wireless devices. Uh, location obviously uh, gets um, uh, what uh, very blurry uh, in, in those areas because if you're coming off of a wireless network, the phone could be uh, in a lot of locations and there's no GPS that's going to find you that you're in the backwoods of Alabama, for example. Uh, but what, what it would know is um, is the uh, the uh, type of device uh, that's being utilized. Uh, the ports that it's coming in in the environment, whether that uh, system, whether that particular device has been uh, accessed in, in the uh, network before, uh, and start building trust regarding the, uh, the wireless device. Um, we do have a specific uh, demo uh, on how we manage our wireless devices, and um, if the individual asks that question uh, is interested, I'd be, be happy to uh, either provide a demo or a little bit more detail on how we go about that. 
Next question. Uh, can this be used to monitor virtual terminals, say, for example, in a Citrix environment? Great question. Um, instead of taking the risk and being only 90% certain, what I'll do is follow up with an, with an email and, and get a, uh, an exact answer. I believe the answer to that is yes, but uh, I want to be sure before I uh, before I uh, say categorically. So why don't I follow up with that one with an, with an email uh, to the individual that sent it. Uh, I see Terry um, send it to uh, Terry and follow up. <clears throat> All right. And then right. I think we might have time for uh, at least one more. Let's see if we can at least squeeze one more in. How can I decrease the time it takes for us to detect an incident? Okay. Yeah, that's Real, it is very important. Um, automation is going to be the key. Uh, so we, when we look at you know, the big talk in the industry is uh, big data analytics. Uh, big data analytics is is taking a look at the operating environments and trying to under, understand anomalies within those environments. Uh, one might even call it artificial intelligence. Um, this is the way that you're going to be able to uh, understand what's going on in broad networks in the future. So take our behavior analytics uh, functionality within the product uh, using a baseline of how those particular devices have been used in the past and then compare them in real time, in operating time, to highlight those that have gone uh, beyond normalized operation. That will produce a significantly lower subset of what the security organization, uh, the response team, needs to go and take a look at internally. So the whole idea is instead of going in and taking a look at broad reports and trying to identify anomalies as a human being, is take a look, use uh, machine learning and data analytics to do the processing work of millions of uh, data points and just highlighting those items uh, that are that percolate to the top as, as the anomalies so that the human being can go in and then use their security you know, expertise to see is this um, is this appropriate behavior or is it not appropriate behavior? Uh, can I explain why this is happening? Oh, so and so uh, happened to be locked out and they tried to access through a different port. Okay, that's acceptable. We'll let them in. Or has that particular um, device been compromised? Someone spoofed it and is actually trying to suck out information. So the ability to automate that and bring that to the topic for uh, to the force so the response team can act on it. Or in, the, or in the severe cases where you're in a high security in, environment where you can turn it off and then see if you want to build trust and bring it back on is the way to solve uh, the, the scalability issues that we're going to have with the Internet of Things. All right. Well, great. Thanks, Dino. Uh, with that, today's session has concluded. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank our guest speaker, Dino Balafas, for joining us today. And of course, thanks to everyone else for tuning in. Uh, again, a couple of quick reminders here. Um, the, uh, we will, as far as anyone that's interested in slides from this presentation, uh, the good folks over at Great Bay Software will uh, be taking care of those uh, requests uh, post uh, webinar uh, for those interested in slides. And then also, uh, I just wanted uh, one last quick reminder that this webcast will be available on demand. Uh, beginning tomorrow on the SC Media website under the Events tab. Uh, so with that, for SC Media, this has been Bradley Barth. Until next time, have a safe day online.